it's often said that we don't know much about Bach, but if you compare him, for instance, with the great English poet Shakespeare, we know a huge amount. <laughs> Bach is a rather uh, strange phenomenon historically. I think it really exposes his personality in the music. He's working, for me, really against the grain and saying things that other people don't dare to say. The Bach cello suites remain a mystery. The composer left no instructions on how to play them. It's not clear for which kind of cello they were written. And the manuscript copied by Bach's wife Anna Magdalena is littered with inaccuracies. Where better to start unravelling those mysteries than Oxford, home to Magdalen College and Professor Lawrence Dreyfus, one of the most eminent Bach scholars of our days. And he is joined by his equally eminent colleague, Professor John Butt of Glasgow University. Furthermore, Hollywell Music Room, Europe's oldest purpose-built concert room, is the setting for Dutch cello virtuoso Peter Wispelway to challenge himself to discover still more about Bach by performing all six cello suites in one concert. The Oxford concert is the dress rehearsal for Wispelway's third CD recording of the suites in celebration of his 50th birthday. But for this third recording, Wispelway is going further than ever before and Dreyfus and Butt will also help him find playable solutions to a number of performance issues. What is the ideal tempo for a saraband? How naughtily should one play a bourree? And even for a man who has played the suites almost a thousand times, there are still many mysteries to solve. I did two recordings before this one. Uh, there was a gap of seven years, and the gap between number two and number three, which is coming out now, is, will be 14 years. I find that very long. Um, my intention still is to, uh, to do th three more, at least. Six suites, six recordings. Um, I'm, I'm playing a different instrument. I mean a different Baroque cello, different Baroque bow as well. Um, and I'm playing at a different pitch, the 392 pitch. The first two recordings were at a sort of standard Baroque pitch that everybody's playing, uh, the 415 for the A. Um, now I'm, I'm a semitone down that creates a completely different uh, cello universe. I mean, the, the sound is, is even more relaxed, but it's also more rustic and raw. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's a matter of, 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 of colours and, and how you speak with your with your little baroque bow. Um, Peter, zullen we dat laatste stukje nog eens opnieuw doen? Misschien vanaf die lage sis daar. Wam pam pam. Ja? Dan hebben we die hele hoge passage ook nog eens, hè? Oké. Okay. Goed. Geef rood. Heel mooi, heel goed. Playing this instrument at 392 is, yeah, is quite a different affair from uh, playing a Baroque cello at 415. I've got one here, um, which is more or less tuned at 415, if it's still in tune, that is. And well, then you, you, you get a, yeah, it's, it's very different. <laughs> If I play that on all this, this 
third recording is also about meeting uh, John Butt and Larry, and Larry Dreyfus. Uh, they're both great performers, uh, performers of Bach's music. Um, and I've, I've, I've met them quite a few times um, in the last few years. And, and suddenly this, this idea came up that I wanted to, to, to get more out of them. I wanted to pick their brains um, and, and use them to, to get into Bach's brain even, even deeper. Many cellists, especially since uh, the great the great guru Casal started playing them, consider these pieces as the, sort of the bible for, for cellists. Um, but of course, you you both have the the grand, grand overview of uh, of his whole repertoire. So, what are these suites? Are they are they mi minor details in his in his output, or are they more than that? I think they are significant works. Absolutely. Uh, in the sense that they're perhaps the second group of six uh, pieces that fit into a whole collection of string music. So we have the violin, sonatas, and partitas as volume one, and then we have this conceived at the six suites as volume two. So we see a project of complete ideas in the same way that the clavier Ubel has four parts, and I think that's a very important side to the cello suites. What is the order of these two? Um, my guess is that um, Bach would have written the violin ones first because the, the cello ones are more of a compositional challenge. There are fewer notes to play with. Uh, you have to have more experience at single line counterpoint in order to bring out a, a whole polyphonic texture. So my guess is that the experience of writing the violin ones was essential for Bach's um, conception of the second collection. But it might well be that it was a mixture of these. It might be that he wrote some of the violin ones and then wrote a cello one and, and so on. This would be perfectly the, similar to what happened with the Brandenburg concertos and with the well-timed clavier from the same period. Write a few of them, do something else, write a few more, do something else. Um, so, um, yes, Bach's, the final version of any of Bach's collections is very seldom likely to correspond to the original motives for it. But, by and large, I would say it's, it's, it seems likely that the cello suites came second. And so they, they would be conceived as a cycle, as six suites, mm. and maybe instantly in his head. He thought, OK, six pieces for cello, I start with G major. Is that how he would, would have thought? John? <laughs> it's difficult to tell, really. I mean, I, uh, sixes appears um, not just in the case of the string pieces, but also keyboard works, the six part eaters, uh, six Brandenburg concertos, six sonatas for organ as well. And they all seem to have both uh, a youth value, but also a pedagogical value and a sort of imaginative value. In, in, in other words, each of them seems to have set a challenge both for the performer uh, in each case, but also yeah. for Bach himself. And I think um, the cello suites in particular are very important, most of all because of the limitations of the instrument. Yeah. That, that, that by being forced to write fewer notes, he actually implies many, many more. Yeah, Bach was, 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 can be seen as an, as an unconventional, eccentric composer. Not eccentric as, as, as uh, you know, an old man who, who wants to be uh, against uh, the, the world, but somebody who had, had very strong ideas or, or developed strong ideas and didn't care about uh, whether he was breaking rules. Um, so this was not an old-fashioned man who was, was uh, producing music that was already outdated when, when, when he was uh, composing it. This was a raging talent who couldn't just stop himself from what he was doing. But there seems to be a disconnect between his music and huge musical output in manuscripts, and uh, mainly in manuscripts, and the details of his life, which often seem rather trivial. You know, the, the um, constant bickering with authority uh, about his status. It seems that he got angry very easily. Um, and there's a wonderful underlining in his Karloff Bible commentary when he says that, um, well, when, when the commentary says that um, you should be angry on behalf of your office and status, but never on behalf of your person. Um, so it does seem that Bach had a very strong view of status and was very happy to be angry in that context if, if that status was violated. I think it's the approbation of certain kinds of musicians. I think there's some very subtle hints when you have 
again, a very enlightened critic, such as Scheiber, who had studied with him, who then forswears him and refers to him obliquely as someone that is in the wrong aesthetic, as someone that is not modern, someone that is somehow doing things that are bombastic, schwulstig, you know, things that are uh, com too complex, fervoren. These, he is charged with unnaturalness. That's a very grave charge in the 18th century. I mean, you, you charge pederasts with unnaturalness, you know, in the 18th century. I don't think we, we see how, how strange that was. Even the people in the Bach circle, Lorenz Mitzler, uh, who founded this wonderful Society for Musical Sciences in Leipzig, uh, describes Bach setting uh, an ode as a cantata, as sehr unnatürlich. You know, it's, it's a very, very strange thing to do in print for someone that you're close to. Uh, so I think we need to read these signs um, and take these hints as these negative receptions, as a kind of positive sign of what he thought he was doing. And then we can see that in the music when we compare it with that of his contemporaries, the successful contemporaries in particular. We do see some very strange things that, uh, that Bach is not going with the tide and he do is, doesn't aspire to normal kinds of success. play a piece of Bach and play um, some one of the contemporaries and you I mean someone who's just a layperson will see in five minutes you know this is just immediately this is a different kind of mind there's more complexity people may not get the negational sides of it but then when we start investigating historically the kinds of compositional decisions he was making we see this working very much against all of the categories of good taste which are then laid out the French are are perhaps more um, have that je ne sais quoi about, about good taste. The Germans, being Germans, are going to spell everything out. They want to tell you how to write genres, do not mix this, this mustn't go there. If you're going to write a pastoral, be sure that you don't write any nasty uh, dissonances or nasty harmonies because it's about sheep and pastoral shepherds and so forth. What does Bach do? He writes pastorals with lots of sin and suffering <laughs> in there and it has a wonderful uh, kinds of resonances with religion, but I think also with personal experience. And as a player, I mean, I know this quite intimately and I, and I see it so much in Peter as well. There's no way that you cannot make yourself into a conduit for this music and assume a kind of personality, a kind of person speaking through this music. One way of looking at, at this um, cycle is, uh, um, is, is see, just seeing how, how Bach starts off uh, sort of normal <laughs> and then departs from the from normality um, again one two three understandable cello music <laughs> Thank you. 
example. But that's a great example yeah. because we, we watch this motive from the beginning, which is you know a very diatonic, minor, very tragic, mm -hmm. all of a sudden turning into this element of pain, you know, and being stretched, you know, over yeah. uh, over these three strings. Um, you know, I think there's that element, the kind again, this trajectory mm -hmm. of taking a, a, a simple gesture that is just. Uh, part of the could triad of music that couldn't be simpler. Mm. Yes, yes. And then turning that into C sharp, B flat, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, you know yeah. it's, it's pulling it apart yeah. in yeah. a really ungainly way. So the idea that you get up in the morning and you just say, I'm feeling bad about the death of my wife, I'm gonna write a prelude. You see, it's not strong enough, I think, as a concept. Now, whether there is personal grief in this piece is so obvious that it doesn't need discussing because how could you play this? I mean, the fact that, that the experience of that opening uh, as Peter played it as well, that then gets stretched um, into this, uh, this searing pain. I mean, that's what diminished sevenths are about in music. They're bad intervals, um, and they're painful, tra they're more than tragic. I wouldn't mind betting that Bach um, wrote the first three as a group, and then probably spent a long time on the second three, on the order, how to place them, what keys they should be in, because this is exactly what we find in collections such as the third part of the Klavier Übung, that, that he starts out with a good pattern that seems to work for the piece, and then after a while he changes his mind. And so you can almost feel, sense him setting out with an ordered intention, which yeah. uh, oversteps itself. <laughs> Prelude to number three, um, and, and in one of the manuscripts it says presto, so, and, and I like that idea, because um, then even more you get this stream of consciousness mm. going. Uh, but, but yeah, so, so I, I, I choose a few moments where I take, take a breath. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I took too many. I, mm. I, just wondering how you think uh, about you, the you setting off of justice. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, so, well, this, so the, this is the C major one. Yeah. <laughs> Is that press already, or should it be? That's a little bit fast. I think when, you know, <laughs> there, you know Felix Gallimir, I studied chamber music with him, at least in the British Quartet, he said there's always one bar in a piece of music, you know, which tells you what the tempo needs to be for yes. the rest of the piece, you know. Absolute speed is not important. It's, it's, in, it's the relationship of things. It's the, it's the, the feel of speed that's Time much, much more important than the absolute metronomic speed. Yeah. Um, and I, I tend to follow Kienberger's advice in terms of speeds, by which you... First of all, look at the time signature, then you look at the genre of the piece, then you look at the fastest note, and you work out, well, what's going to work? What, what bar is it, what, what motive or bar is, gives you a, a, a clue? Then look for Italian. Only look at the Italian at the end, because that often modifies what your expectations would have been. So presto, in other words, means slightly faster than you would have expected, having taken all the other things into account already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then number four, with, with the weird, in the weird key, the uh, awkward key, um, uh, of E flat major, we uh, we think Eroica, or we think Zauberflöte, Mozart. We think big, big, big noise. Uh, uh, but of course, you can't produce a big noise. I mean, you can produce a nice resonant. But that's about it. I mean, it's, it's on the modern cello. You can do. Uh, this. 
that's awful on a baroque cello so somehow that's not right then uh, uh, but still you've got that in your in your head so it should be should be like like an organ um, but then you could also just change your your concept completely and think well why organ why not loot like uh, Professor Dreyfus suggested um, and maybe half of the concerts I did I played lute and the other half I was I was hinting at organ uh, so now I'm, I'm definitely I'm in, in, in lute land um, so that means that I'm going to use my bow as if I'm plugging a string <laughs> makes it very very intimate so the bow will do just tiny movements and so it becomes sort of a meditation then um, and still in this little world there are all these excursions to other other Worlds. I mean, like this uh, whirlwind thing. Uh, this this toccata element. Uh, it's it's all there, and and then there's there's really some some drama later on in this prelude, and then and then the movement ends like it started. Just. <laughs> Abruptly, <laughs> and then number five, he <laughs> tunes down, down the, the top string. So then, then it gets seriously dark and black at times. Um, I mean, the the uh, the, the Sarabans, the graveyard, if you want, um, the opening with the. Uh, That suite is extremely dark and powerful. Um, and then you get this number six where when the four strings is not enough anymore. And 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 and, and instead of dark it becomes extremely light. Um, the top E string and, and everything starts to jubilate. <laughs> So this this is the piccolo cello, and it and it has this added string. So this is still normal cello, and then and you have the gift of the, uh, the the high E string, and and of course Bach builds his whole piece around this fifth string, uh, starting uh, around that string. Then he goes up to, and then a few bars later, he he suddenly brings out this this novelty.
Yeah, I, I mean, I was lucky enough to start uh, uh, as a kid on, on gut string, so uh, I got was my... That normal then? No, this my, my teacher was quite, quite um, fanatic about it, but she was right. Dicky Booker was, uh, was my teacher for, for 10 years, and I, I, I lived in her house for, for 25 years, I think. I mean, I rented an apartment. Um, but so many hours of, of talking about music and listening to music, looking at scores and, 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 be, and being introduced to Alfred Della's music, uh, Dieter Fischer's guy, the whole lead repertoire, um, but, but also Stravinsky and, and, and choreographers like Bejar and Kilian and, and Wagner operas, Bruckner symphonies. Um, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of early music as well, uh, but but it was it was quite broad, <laughs> and 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 I will I will always be grateful for that fantastic introduction into the world of music and and art. See, somehow the pooling doesn't result in um, lust. I mean, uh, in, in in pleasure in 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 in, in a in something uh, like, like, like this. So somehow, uh, maybe it's not louder, but somehow the resonance, the, 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 the body of the instrument is... Strings ring is, much. They more. ring. Yeah, the string the steel string sort of stops dead when you stop yeah. pushing it. A gut string just goes on. So that's why you add um, um, vibrato to just get, get a bit of glamour out of it. Of course, there were uh, gut strings. Pirastro, the old German uh, firm, they were around. Uh, it was not difficult to get, uh, to get gut strings, but it was considered um, something old-fashioned. Um, instead, my mother uh, very much insisted uh, on gut strings. Um, I think for purely, uh, for her, for mu purely musical reasons. I mean, she found, you know, she profoundly believed that the the quality of, uh, of the instrument and the quality of the music that you would perform um, would, would come across uh, in, a, in a more convincing, convincing way. As far as, as Baroque instruments and, and, and gut strings are concerned and, and um, the early music movement is concerned, um, I've never, never been a, a member, I've, I've never paid paid my membership or whatever. Um, but what I did was just investing hundreds of hours on my, on a, a cello, which originally was, uh, well, in the first place, wasn't a Brock cello yet. I got a Brock cello in my mid twenties or early twenties. Um, but, but so I, I just started working, started to emulate what I'd heard um, um, and, and read a few treatises on the way. And then I thought, no, I need to do it on my own. I had to create my own style, my own feeling for the bow, my feeling for hair on gut string, uh, on rope. Uh, that, 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 was, that was important. Um, of course, I, I didn't become a member of, of, of a movement. I just picked the fruits.
there? I don't think we can honestly know for sure. I mean, there are some things that's very striking when, we, when you have you playing in thumb position uh, where we guess that they, they didn't do that yet. No. And, um, and certain kinds of things in the sixth suite even, uh, which would make much more sense with a, with a slightly smaller instrument yeah. held da spalla on the shoulder. Um, we've got iconographical depictions that seem to go both ways. Um, the question is really whether Bach cared about this particularly. Um, the big difference was that if you have an instrument up like this, it is easier for a violinist violist to come and say, ah, I think I could manage this, and if I can stretch this far um, with this instrument tied around uh, my neck, that I can play with a certain kind of fingering. It's quite clear that Bach, in a sort of homage to his background, uh, you know, from the sort of craftsman sort of milieu, knew a lot about instrument design, and he was from the... From the opening of his career, he was introduced to, you know, instruments in progress, uh, organs, uh, um, the Stadtpfeife, Stadtgeiger um, culture. So I think he was always interested in, in instruments and experimenting with them, but I don't think he thought about them in the same way that a 19th century or 20th century composer mm. would have thought, because they were still in, in progress. That's right. Um, they didn't have an essential identity. Yeah. And, and th there's a very telling document from 1730 when he appears, when he's writing to his town council, he appears to be envious of the court at Dresden, because he said, at Dresden, they only have to play one instrument each, so they can really perfect it. So in a certain sense, he's looking towards what you might think of modern division of labor, where you just play one instrument. Uh, but his entire background is, is quite the opposite of that. Uh, we've got these Stadtpfeifer that mostly play the, um, the wind instruments, and then we have these people called the Kunstgeige, okay, the art fiddlers, um, who were probably not all that artistic, we were municipal employees. And then we have students. We, mu we know that there were a huge number of students, I'm sure, both playing and singing um, for Bach uh, in his establishment. And there, it's really hard to know, but I assume that the ones that are really talented um, are going to be given the more difficult parts. So when it comes to this notion of cello and cello suites, and we don't have a dedicatee, uh, we don't have one person, uh, even the lute version of the fifth suite has a, a name on it, Monsieur Schuster, you know. But it's an interesting question what Bach really cared about in, in writing these pieces, because it's, even though it is a, a set aesthetically, we already have three different instrument types there. If we think about the fifth suite with the, the scordatura, with the change from the A string to G, and then the violoncella cinq called, you know, the set with five string cello uh, at the end. Um, but I think it would have been silly for him to talk about it in some way as a Daspala instrument essentializing that versus playing it this way. The, the big problem we face is that if we look at the cello technique at the time, what's really interesting is there doesn't seem to have been thumb position in use yet. Now it's possible Bach invented this and people were using it, we don't really know. But certain passages where we could watch Peter in last night's performance, you know, using his thumb, frankly on a slightly smaller instrument, um, with it would be less wide, um, would probably be able to be played in one position without, without a thumb. are not sort of standard, normal repertoire for a Baroque composer. Uh, but Bach was far too uh, unconventional. So it, it was experimental. Um, it was a challenge to himself. Um, it was going to be a challenge to the players and the listeners. Uh, and, and he was challenging dancers. He was using dancers and, and, and exploiting them and, and, and going beyond the dancers. Have you ever tried leading people to dance? Um, well, yeah, a few, a few times. Um, and, um, but, but also with uh, contemporary choreographers, like, mm. like Yeji Kilian, just a, mm -hmm. a giant in the field. And um, 
Yeah, yeah they, they don't want to go too fast. If you see people dancing about today, at least mm. uh, reconstructions of dances, they're, mm. very, they're much they're... more energetic than you'd think. OK. And... We think of them as being very elegant and rather measured in a certain sense, but in mm. fact... Yeah, I thought of them courtly, more, yes, more courtly than yeah, a more courtly. Yeah, but there's a huge but... amount of foot movement, you know, that goes mm. into it. Mm. Mm. But I wonder whether those foot movements are not actually brought into what we call stylized dance pieces. That is to say, yeah. the fancy footwork and the fancy handwork, you know, in the, in the French choreography, yeah. we have... You know, we have priority for the hands as well as the feet. So that all of that comes into this style of, of, of you know, highly stylized dance music, which would make it not suitable for dancing because the dancers are already there. You are the dancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In this case. Yeah, I'm, I'm now thinking of bourrées. <gasps> bourrées, yes. Bourrées. Mm. I always think of bourrées as being wild. Yes. And, and, and fast. Are you thinking of the fourth one already? Yeah, the third is what? Third well, well, right. I mean... <laughs> Is that, a, is that an okay tempo for a beret, or were they much faster? No, I think that, that uh, to my mind, uh, is, uh, is pretty... Yeah, so it, it, would be, it would be a little bit faster than a gavotte. Yes, yeah. I think so, yeah. yeah. The point is that the dancers are moving, typically, from the more serious to the light. There's a kind of culinary metaphor here, maybe coming even from the French idea of a great meal in the suite. You know, you have this following of, uh, of pieces, and as you get to the end, it's just, it's just little light um, ideas. Galanterien at the end is the term he used. The strange thing is that with Gigue, which could be a light piece in his keyboard works, they turn very, very heavy and contrapuntal and fugal. And it's, it's quite an interesting thing that he goes for heavy at the end, which is why, of course, the 19th century likes it much better. Instead of a light, frothy rondo, even though we hear in lots of Mozart, we get something you know quite serious and finale-like uh, at the end of a Bach suite. So as we go into Courant, um, here, you know, Bach was not very good with languages either. I mean, he, he misspelled the Italian word for and his entire life and with an accent. Uh, you know, he, he was not very good at that. Um, so there is a mixture of Correntes and, and Courants. And in the suite, the fifth famously um, has finally a, a something resembling a French Courant, which is it's more Hemiola, 6-4, more artifice, dotted figures, and so forth. The notion of running, of course, comes into uh, Courant. And the Italian currentes that he's actually writing here are, are, on the surface at least, you know, running pieces that are quite light, showy still, and more serious in terms of playing off gestures. They're, they're longer than, of course, the little pieces. <laughs> And then we get to the, you know, the Bourrées minuets and so forth, which are always in these, in these paired uh, groupings and allow for a kind of play of light and shadow uh, with the contrast. If one is in major, then the second one will be in minor. And that kind and vice versa. And that the kind of play and the contrast between these two um, are the kind of topic that they're playing with. So you can imagine that Bach is already thinking about how this kind of musical material will contrast. And the contrasts are extreme. This was not a typical thing. I mean, Peter, for example, makes a point of, of changing tempo rather radically. Um, 
In actual dance suites of the period, if you had a series of, let's say, two minuets, very often we're, we're pretty sure that from the dancers needed a lot of time to get around and have more choreography than the music just changed. They probably just did them ataka without stopping and certainly at the same tempo. So that is a very interesting example where historically, you know, uh, one should be reproved, Peters. They do not change tempo between these two. But what he's pointing toward is this extreme that they turn into character pieces, pièces de caractère. So the sarabans have to be certainly the most extraordinary uh, movement um, amidst the center, center of the suites. And typically these were, these were dances that were very aristocratic um, and were dances were quite formal in order to be, for the aristocracy to show how light they were. So for example, people might uh, always go on the downbeat up in French rock dance. So they move up like this. You see dancers are always going up. It's very, very different from sort of a 19th century waltz where people are going down into the ground, which is much more bourgeois grounded uh, phenomenon. And um, with the Sarbans, there was also this sense that um, they had to be somehow weightless, even though there were these heavy beats and they would have to come down for gravity reasons. Um, at the end of the four bar phrase, it would be this ton de courant, which you'd have to sort of come down, you'd go up again. And the idea was very much that you would be traveling around the room with partners and in these wonderful configurations, um, tied by a string to the ceiling. So you're always uh, amidst this, you're being controlled at the same time that you're being very expressive with hands and feet and, and eyes and gesture. And uh, what I believe is that the, these gestures sort of come into Bach's music, that, that the, all this stylized stuff that is happening in the great dancing must have been part of his, his conception, but also he seems to personalize them and sing much more um, in them. And there's a kind of sense, particularly in the minor suites, of, of great tragedy um, in, in these sarabans, a sort of unbelievable uh, sadness that is coming there, but all very formed at the same time and, and slightly held back. I find quite often on listening to these pieces that uh, during the course of the piece, I feel I'm not quite sure what sort of movement this is. Is it a dance? Is it a gavotte? Is it a um, allemande? Or so on. Um, and one could almost get frustrated in the course of listening and feel Bach is really keeping us away from the true piece here. He, uh, when's he going to reveal it? And you get to the end of the piece and suddenly you think, well, actually, now I come to think of it, my memory puts everything together. And in fact, it was a gavotte. It was an allemande. And I think this is one of the qualities of Bach that is shared by very few composers, certainly not of his own age and, and uh, very few after. So somehow he conjures up the experience of hearing a gavotte without actually presenting you with the full score, the full notes of one. <laughs>
So it's often said that playing the cello suites, it's, uh, it's all about rhetoric. But of course, um, rhetoric is, 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 is technique of, of, of bringing things uh, to the surface. It's dance and singing. It couldn't be more true for suites, where, where we have formal dance forms. Using these tools um, almost forces you to, to speak. You, you, can, you, can, you can sing, and you will, you will sing, but it's all done with this little brush, and, and, uh, and that, yeah, that makes it yeah, a delightful um, language. This is a project that I've been looking forward to for a very, very long time. Uh, and it has, yeah, for me personally, has been extremely rewarding. Um, one of the discoveries, well, has to be the the pitch, the 392 pitch. Um, I mean, the new sonorities that it, that it brings, um, and and even more remote from the modern cello sound. And and it 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 it's, has opened doors for for me, uh, and I'll. In, in the next 10 years, every time I perform the Bach Suites, it, it will, it, I will be carrying this with me. I have no idea whether he will stop here. At another uh, 15 years, he'll be 65, and uh, so he could do his pension uh, version of the, of the Bach Suites. I have no idea. Um, it depends. It can, uh, it can also happen that you suddenly lose interest. It's that you... It's like an old love that suddenly you're not in love with anymore and you say, uh, uh, I give up. Or I, or di I direct my mind uh, into a completely different direction.